Welcome, Matt Rigo of Spotlight Growth here with Peter Goldstein, the founder of Exchange Listing LLC and member of the prestigious Forbes Business Council. Thank you for your time today, Peter. Great to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. Jumping right into things, the recent U.S. banking turmoil has led to the closures of Silicon Valley Bank's Signature and Silvergate Banks. Given that these banks really had a close uh, relationship with the startup and cryptocurrency ecosystem, do you see any um, material impact on small cap IPOs moving forward? Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting times, Matt, right? Like both of these scenarios, I would really separate them, first of all. One more, you know, meaning Silicon Valley Bank was more focused on the pre-IPO, you know, the tech community and the I think more traditional companies coming out of Silicon Valley, where Silvergate was more focused on, you know, alternative trading for cryptocurrencies uh, and such. And then, of course, you add in Signature Bank, which was more on the digital asset related components. So I think each one of those will have their own different impacts. Of course, it's still a little early to tell exactly. But generally speaking, I think the investment in, in sentiment towards digital asset related companies uh, could find it more difficult through an IPO in those you know, related sectors because of the instability uh, that's shown up you know, specifically from Silvergate uh, and, and probably in addition you know, with Signature Bank. Uh, Silicon Valley is a whole different story in my opinion because the ecosystem that they played in the IPO market uh, had been developed and nurtured over many, many years. And they provided more than just capital, but if you take and you break it down, you know, they provided capital. They also provided custody, you know, payment processing, liquidity management. You know, their business was based on nurturing these companies through their stage of development towards an IPO. And of course, the deposits that come from the venture capital community and then post IPO, you know, from the proceeds of their offering. So certainly I think that's going to affect the overall IPO climate much more. And, and specifically, I think companies will need to find alternative solutions, uh, which I really believe are going to be more expensive than what they were finding at, at Silicon Valley Bank in the form of debt uh, and capital that may come in through maybe a mixture or a combination of debt and equity, uh, debt being more expensive and equity more, more than likely coming in at lower valuations than they have been predicted by the venture community. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, kind of just moving along here. Through this first quarter of 2023, uh, it seems like we really are starting to see kind of a pushback on ESG investing. Um, you know, first we had the U.S. Senate overturn a Labor Department uh, ruling on ESG. And of course, uh, President Biden chose to use his uh, first veto in office to overturn that. Um, also, you know, we have Vanguard, the second largest uh, asset manager with, you know, assets under management of 8.1 trillion, who, you know, recently pulled out of the uh, net zero asset managers initiative. So my question is, is, is this really sort of a, uh, the first major test for ESG investing, or is this kind of a uh, vote of no confidence from some pretty influential groups um, in the investment space? Yeah, I think it's a blend of both, Matt, really, in, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, investors, I believe, still are focused on companies that have strong values that are bringing value to the marketplace. And, and the disconnect here is where does value drive, get driven from values? And I think overall, what happened with the Senate to me was, was that there was a concern that there was some political bias uh, that, that's going to kind of undermine the fiduciary responsibility of asset managers who are there to maximize returns for their clients, right? So, so overall, I think ESG investing doesn't need to sacrifice financial returns, but in terms of the U.S. Senate, I think that political bias uh, is, is stepping in where, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in letting business, you know, kind of the invisible hand theory, you know, find its own levels. Um, but with that said, you know, many studies have shown that companies that score well on ESG initiatives uh, outperform their peers over the long term. Hmm. So I don't believe this is necessarily a no confidence vote. I think that ESG is finding its way in its own maturity and development. Uh, and then you bring in asset managers like Vanguard 
And, and you know, the, 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 the situation for me that I'm, because I'm a big proponent of ESG, but someone like Vanguard's position is, how is that being transparently measured and recognized by investors, right? So if you don't know how they're measuring it and it's not fully transparent, and in a sense, are we greenwashing or companies greenwashing the space, how do you incorporate that into an investment decision? And it makes it really hard when there's not a clear, transparent, definitive measure. And that's, I think, part of where Vanguard would make their, their position. So while I think there are more and more in investors that are interested in, you know, environmental, you know, sustainability, social responsibility, right, governance, which I'm a huge component of, uh, asset managers are going to want to continue to see that, but they're going to want to see that in a very clearly stated value proposition and let's say a business case, Matt, that, that then is translated into the ROI uh, for these asset managers that are in business, right, to get a return on their investment. Yeah, exactly. That, uh, that, that definitely makes sense considering, you know, I think um, it's, it's definitely important for, you know, ESG. I think the, the principles are definitely sound, uh, but I, I agree. I, I definitely think there is some room for uh, politicizing and kind of, you know, kind of, you know, having a, uh, a political bias, so to speak. So, yeah, absolutely. There is. And, and then I, I'll take a little bit further, Matt, that I think the boards of these companies have now, they have new responsibilities. ESG was never on a board level. Uh, thought about or talked about, I would say, you know, certainly, you know, over the last decade. And there have been leaders in that, you know, very large corporations like Nike, who was very, very early on in, in creating a board level mandate and then special committees that were responsible for incorporating ESG practices into the overall corporate values and then being able to translate those into initiatives that got executed. But now, you know, as a board member of a few public companies, an advisor to public companies, the board takes a role in making sure that management is really truly participating in an ESG initiative uh, and, and not just putting it out as, you know, general compliance requirement to check a box, nor as marketing to promote something that isn't really being, you know, fulfilled upon or translated. So there's a lot more to this. The topic, right, is a very kind of controversial topic um, from from the perspective of where are the companies and there by the board of directors really implementing, you know, what the ESG initiatives are, and then how does that translate into ultimately, you know, profitability, both from you know bottom line as well as what I would call profitability from a social, environmental, and governance perspective. Oh, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, kind of moving on here to our our, uh, our third and last question, um, you know, naked short selling has really kind of come back into focus here, especially in the last couple of years. You know, I've, I've seen some experienced Wall Street bankers that say, hey, you know what, this it's it's kind of overblown. There's real no evidence of uh, a proven uh, naked short selling as a widespread issue. However, couldn't the now infamous GameStop debacle of 2021 kind of serve as a at the very least, a potential case of naked short selling. Also, do you believe naked short selling is as prevalent and widespread as as some people may, uh, you know, believe? Yeah, let's let's break it down, Matt. So I, I'm going to take the latter part of uh, of your you know kind of discussion points first. Naked sell, short selling, and short selling have been around for a very long time, and it's certainly been a controversial topic that I think has grown. Uh, certainly in the last year to year and a half, but this is not new. Uh, you know, it, it goes all the way from where I live in the micro cap and small cap markets all the way up to, you know, mid and large cap companies. And it, it certainly, I believe, is much more prevalent than others believe. And, and my primary issue is that it really causes harm to investors and to companies and individuals, right? That you know, are, are operating in good faith to support and invest in growth companies that are then potentially undermined by short selling and even worse, which is naked short selling, right? So, you know, when an investor is selling shares of stock without actually borrowing them and delivering those shares, they're participating in an ecosystem now that's been developed 
unfortunately, in Wall Street that I think is quite prolific and, and does cut across almost every sector within Wall Street. So with that said, I, I think that it's a very significant problem and I've seen it get only worse uh, from companies being attacked that have done nothing wrong. There's, there's no foul play. There are no bad actors. There's no bad intent. Uh, these are companies that are only trying to grow uh, and then therefore they need capital to be able to support the growth of these companies. And that capital comes at a much you know, higher cost if shorters are driving down uh, the overall economic and enterprise value of a, of a public company. There are bad actors that I think have been called out by shorters. Uh, you're going to see more of that coming. Uh, and those bad actors, I believe, are getting what they deserve. Uh, but I'm more in defense of the good guys and, and the companies that we work with and the CEOs that we work with, where we track the short selling and then further we track the naked short selling. And there are metrics and there are now algorithms and, and programs that have been written by specialists that can actually pinpoint the volume of shares being traded that are both short and sadly even more that you know important is the naked shorts. And there's very little that's being done or can be done uh, at this point. There are you know now regulations have been passed by the SEC. Um, they're not being widely uh, um, you know uh, supported uh, by the SEC as far as them taking action. Um, but there are a large number of movements going on on that in the marketplace to protect value for companies that are under attack uh, from shorters and, and from naked shorters uh, who are only there to profit off the demise of, of value in perfectly solid companies that have done nothing to you know really elicit this short attack. So I'm 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 you know very much a believer that companies need to be proactive in defending their positions. Uh, and, and defending against the PACs, which is almost like a, uh, an all-out war these days, um, because the defenses are, are you know, are, they, are, they do exist. We have tools. Uh, I've participated in, in putting these tools forth as far as putting short sellers on notice, as far as the clearing firms, uh, and calling out activities uh, around certain uh, trading that goes on, uh, which even in the, I've seen now in IPOs, uh, in the pre-market activity, before there are even shares that are able to be sold, somebody's already actively shorting the stock uh, prior to an open market. So it is quite prolific uh, and, and I think a very significant issue. Um, now to come back to GameStop. Um, you know, GameStop is, a, is, is really a saga, right? It's like it's taken on such a life of its own with, you know, just not only what occurred in the market, but with all the stories and then the sub stories beyond, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and, and it highlighted what can happen, right? It's really took what happens every day to an extreme. So, you know, while this is something that I think is unusual, clearly for all of us, but the impact of social media on stock prices, both good and bad, are very much apparent in a situation like, like GameStop. And I think the social media plays into our first conversation uh, about you know, the banks. And there was certainly an issue of information coming out to the market in the form of social media on tweets that went out by very you know, <laughs> prominent individuals within the financial community that I believe accelerated the demise of Signature Bank. There were a lot of really bad practices going on from management, you know, from lack of risk containment. You know, we could talk more about that, Matt. But social media, as, as you bring it up, was the big driver in GameStop. Mm -hmm. And that can work both for a company and against the company. You know, in this case, it's an extreme example of what is a very widespread, widespread problem that got, you know, blown into, you know, a, a really kind of, I think, hopefully, uh, you know, situation where we see again, maybe it's not that extreme, but where shorters uh, are caught now having to cover a naked short and to force them basically to cover, you know, what it is, the damage that they've done, you know, previously to profit off of a business that may or may not, in the case of GameStop, 
deserved what it is that, that they were doing in the way of being shorted. Mm-hmm. And it seems like um, the, uh, the the company Share Intel really is kind of a, a really important tool for, you know, kind of monitoring those, those sort of uh, short selling and naked short selling activities. Um, for other, you know, other uh, public CEOs that may be watching, um, what else would you, uh, you know, recommend to them uh, in terms of kind of tackling this issue that, which as, as you noted, is very widespread? Yeah, we have a, like a three or four kind of layered approach to all of this, and it, and it takes resources. So if you are a, a CEO of a public company and you believe that you are, you know, under attack, which I would say most, you know, micro cap and small cap companies are, uh, largely the analogy I use is that you know, you, there, there's really, you, you have to find a way to move the attention to the shorters that they want to go focus on another opportunity and leave this particular company alone. And so that requires a very well-organized, very well-orchestrated approach. And that, that's something that we have three or four different tools, including something like what Share Intel does, which is more of a legal approach. Um, and most micro and small cap companies aren't interested in taking litigation uh, actions you know, against large clearing firms and other brokerage firms. So th- there, are, there are a number of things that can be done to bring awareness to the fact that the company is doing everything it can to block the naked shorting and then really ultimately to drive those shorters away because if the programs are successful, some of which we participated in, then those shorters who then can have their stock called upon for being naked and short are losing money. And then they want to move on to a neighborhood or another company where there's uh, more opportunity for them to short the stocks and for them to profit. So all we're really trying to do is right size and balance out the short selling against real true liquidity. So we want to bring in a line of defense. And in my experience very recently, in the market intelligence that we've gathered, Matt, there's no one item that is going to be successful. It's a long-term commitment. There are a number of items that have to be done and simultaneously done uh, to be able to create a defense line, just as if you're you know, going to battle, because I do believe it is a battle. And, and one line of defense, you know, if you just put out you know, some, some legal letters, uh, it's like fighting a war with a bell spear. It's just not enough. So we, we, you know, we I continue to study this topic. Uh, we consider to work with our, with our companies. Uh, and that also includes creating a lot of awareness you know, you talked earlier a little bit about, you know, GameStop and of course, you know, social media coming to that. Well, that's extreme, but you can also use, you know, social media to create an awareness program to gather the interest of quality investors, to let the shorters know that they're being watched and that there's a plan and a program to bring back stability and value into the price of the stock as it would exist under normal market terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, well, Peter, thank you very much for your time and valuable insights. Uh, you know, these are certainly some big uh, issues we face in the markets today. But, uh, you know, we look forward to continuing to follow your valuable insights here on LinkedIn and uh, as we kind of navigate through this uncertainty here. So we, you know, really appreciate you again coming on. And um, thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure, Matt. Look forward to creating some more stability in the market and getting back to, you know, uh, a real fluid IPO market for the companies that are wanting to enter into the capital markets and to continue to grow and access, you know, capital as we create more economic value and return for all parties. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Well, uh, thank you very much again for your time.